Hello everybody, thanks for joining me today. I'm Brother Barnabas, and today we're in John chapter 2, and it's the account of where Jesus turns um, water into wine. So let's just jump right in, and I hope this is a blessing. If it is, like it or share it after you're done. And um, let's go on to verse 1, John chapter 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told the servants, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. And, you know, as we get into this and look at it deeper, um, I just wanted to uh, point out, you know, that in John, uh, he doesn't give all the disciples all the things that Jesus did. Um, instead, um, John selected seven miracles, seven signs, he calls them. And, um, and at the end of the book, he writes that... Um, all the things that Jesus did, you know, that, that it would be impossible to write them all down. Uh, but these have been written um, so that you might believe in his name, so you might have life in his name. Um, so John selected um, seven signs, uh, seven miracles that Jesus did uh, to kind of represent uh, Jesus and the ministry that he had here on earth and, uh, and persuade the reader that um, Jesus is the Messiah. He is God in the flesh he is the son of god and um which makes us um stop and pause and think um you know this is um john points out this is the first miracle that he did and um and we we must think now why did jesus turn water into wine uh what does it mean what does it represent and why did john choose to uh, uh include this uh, you know right at the very beginning of his gospel i mean this is obviously very significant in john's eyes um, like, you know, uh, John was there and saw it happen and then, and it says all the disciples believed. And it was, you know, at this point that they're getting to know Jesus earlier, early on in his ministry. And, um, and this opened John's eyes and, and helped him to believe. And as we look back at it, let's just take it section by section, verse by verse. And, um, and, and see what we find here. First of all, uh, let's just note it's a wedding, you know, verse 1. And Jesus and the disciples were on, were invited there. And um, when the wine was gone, you know, Mary came and told Jesus, you know, they're out of wine. And um, and the, the first thing that I noticed there, you know, is that um, these people are in relationship with Jesus. You know, uh, probably um, he's there. It's a family, you know, like an extended family member. For some reason, Mary is concerned that, um, that the... Uh, bridegroom isn't embarrassed. It would be a big social stigma if they ran out of wine. And weddings um, in this in the New Testament times um, were not just like a one day affair. I mean, they went on for days. And um, I'll let Hebrew historians, you know, fill in all that. You can go Google that or look online. But just trust me, the wedding was a big party that went on for several days. And running out of wine was a big problem, a big embarrassment. And um, and so. It came to they brought it to Mary's attention that they were out of wine, and then Mary went to Jesus. And to me, this all speaks about relationship. Jesus is there because him and his disciples were were uh, related and uh, and and invited 
So, uh, so people had relationship with Jesus. Uh, they invited him to the wedding. And then they went to Mary, who had the closest of relationships with Jesus. Um, you know, she was his mother. And, um, and Mary went and asked him. And, um, you know, of, co of course, first he says, no, my time hasn't come. We'll get to that in a minute. And then he changes the water into wine. Uh, but the point that really strikes me is when you're in relationship with Jesus, good things happen. I have seen this over and over again in my life, and I think uh, many of you who are watching this video could agree. Um, when you're in a relationship with Jesus and you're, bring, you're casting your cares upon him and you're making your requests known to God with thanksgiving and um, you find yourself in a jam, uh, somehow he just gets you out of it. You know, when things look really bleak, somehow he brings good out of it. You know, just in, in, in seemingly impossible situations. Uh, Jesus uh, seems to show himself strong, you know, to come through and to um, uh, make himself um, shown powerful. And so as we uh, as we continue on, then just just keep that in your back of a mi your mind. You know, this story, um, its foundation is relationship with Jesus. And um, and, you know, before we go any further, too, uh, let me just say I don't like to be critical about my brothers and sisters in Christ. But I've heard so many people talk about this, and they get caught up on the issue of wine and alcohol. And this story is not about whether you should drink wine or not. I know uh, there's some of my good Baptist friends that would even, I've heard preachers say, you know, that um, the wine wasn't alcoholic, it was just grape juice. And, well, that's not true because wine was just a part of the culture at this time. People ate bread, ate food, um, they had bread, they had wine. It was what they drank. It was part of the meal, and um, and then uh, but then I have other friends who are really um, uh, exercising their freedom in Christ Jesus, you know, and they would say, yeah, Jesus just wanted to keep the party going. That's why he um, turned the water into wine and uh, make Jesus out to be like a a party animal, and um, and that's not true either because we know as many verses that there are that are are for wine. You know, it's good for your stomach. It makes the heart glad, and um, and, you know, there's also uh, so many verses that say, no, we uh, drunkenness is wrong. There's two or three times as many verses say, talking about the foolishness of drunkenness and the sinfulness of drunkenness. So so we want to uh, uh, we want to let's continue on. And we're going to see that Jesus turning the water into wine and getting back to my original question. You know, why is this miracle included? And um, I'm just trying to say it's not about. Uh, pro wine or anti wine um, it's all about in my mind as we'll see uh, wine is a picture of God's favor it is a picture of God's grace it's a picture of transformation and um, and we find all these themes uh, regarding wine in the Bible and we'll get into it as we as we go through the scriptures here so just um hang with me here let's go ahead and uh, um, Go back to where uh, uh, J uh, Jesus says to his uh, his mother, my hour has not yet come. You know, Jesus has a time for everything, and he knows there's a time for him, for him to reveal himself. And, um, and he tells his mom, now's not my time. But then apparently he was um, just kidding with his mom or uh, decided, yes, this is the time. Because then he told the servants, do whatever he tells you. And then the, the servants go. And they, um, and, and they fill the water, they fill these ceremonial jugs with water. And these ceremonial jugs are not small jugs. Each one holds like 20 to 30 gallons, the scripture says. And there's six of them. Um, so Jesus doesn't tell them just fill one jug. You know, you think that would be enough. 20 to 30 gallons would be enough wine, you would think. You know, but no, he says all six of them. And the servants filled them to the brim and uh, and then they were all turned to wine. So Jesus turned like 120 gallons plus, 120 to 180 gallons plus, you know, of wine. And um, and that would last a long, long time. A big group of people, many, many days. And uh, and to me, this is just a picture of God's generosity, uh, of how His um, His blessing. Uh, because in the Old Testament, we know that to have um, plenty of wine was a was a sign of blessing. It was a sign of the end times even. You know, Isaiah talking about 
the hills flowing uh, with new wine. And, um, it, you know, and Isaiah saying, you know, come and buy wine without cost. And there's just, uh, and, and we think of Jesus and the, and the, 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 the bridegroom, you know, and the wedding supper of the lamb. And there's just throughout the Bible, there are um, uh, illustrations and allusions to having plenty of wine and having plenty of food and plenty of wine uh, is a blessing from God. You know, my, he makes my, he sets my table in the presence of his enemies. My cup overflows. You know, that cup's not overflowing with water. It's overflowing uh, with wine. And, and, and there's just this abundance of God. A generosity of God that is shown in the in 120 gallons of wine. I mean, this is just incredible in my mind. Jesus didn't just turn one jug into wine; He did all of them. And that brings me to our next point. And um, and wine is often represented, and um, and this is not quite as a direct a relationship. But if you follow my thinking, because I haven't heard a lot of people talk about this. Um, in fact, I can't remember one, but I probably have. I doubt if it's original to me. But in my mind, um, wine is associated with grace. And when I see him changing the wine, the water into wine, it's all about grace. That God's grace is abundant. It's just overflowing. It's without end. And and remember, these are ceremonial jugs. These are these are jugs of water that the Jews used. For their ceremonial washing. It represented keeping the law of the Old Testament. And the grace of God, I believe, you know, comes in the New Testament. And Jesus and John, by including this, this miracle, are saying, you know, the old ways have passed on. There's no need for ceremonial washing anymore. There's no need for all of that. Now we have new wine. We have new grace. And Jesus is entering into a new covenant. So by changing water into wine, he is representing uh, things are changing. There's a transformation coming. There's a new kingdom coming. And that kingdom is um, one of grace, of abundant generosity from God. And, and the wine just represents that. Of course, we're all familiar with um, communion elements, you know, and the the body of Christ, the body and the blood of Christ, um, the bread and the wine, and um, and wine uh, just representing his blood that was shed for us, you know, so that we might have grace and mercy before God, so we might enter into a new covenant with him and no longer live under the old covenant. So I believe all these things in Jesus turning the water into wine, all these things are... Um, are represented are kind of echoing around you know in uh, John the apostle's mind as he as he looks back and thinks about how Jesus turned the water into wine you know um you know uh, again it doesn't specifically state it here but i just really uh feel like from the heart of god like um john looked back you know and he said you know that was really significant jesus was ushering in a new kingdom the new reign of god he was established, he was revealing himself, revealing his ministry. And, um, and he was saying, this is the beginning of the, um, of a new era of the kingdom of God being ushered into this world. And at the end of the culmination, the hills will run with new wine. And, um, and each and every person can come and partake without cost and receive the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And there's just all this imagery of what's going on, and not to mention the transformation. I mean, this is a huge transformation, uh, water into wine. And then you think about how as we come and we put our faith in Christ Jesus, you know, he, we uh, become transformed by the renewing of our mind, by we are born again. We are no longer the, the person that we used to be, but we have new life in Christ Jesus. We are new creations. We are... Um, new and holy and set apart for God and no longer in bondage to sin, no longer in bondage to death and decay, but we receive salvation, we receive healing, we receive grace, we receive mercy. We become a new creation. It's all about transformation. So as we look at this miracle, 
that Jesus did of turning water into wine. It's not just about turning, you know, H2O into the fruit of the vine, you know, and it's not about if we just, if we drink alcohol or not. It's about relationship with Jesus. It's about new grace, about abundant grace, generous grace, never ending grace. It's about the the party in heaven that is to come when we all when we're all together and we celebrate Jesus and everything that he did for us you know it's all about these things and um and I haven't done a real good job of going through it um verse by verse and um I guess uh for the sake of time I won't read the rest of it but just to point out that um that what Jesus does he does right you know the 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 master of the of the wedding uh uh you know the the one in charge you know he said this is the best wine you know you save the best for last and um and when jesus does something when he transforms our life you know when grace comes it comes abundantly and he does it well and let's let's pause for today and uh reflect on God's grace in our lives, the transformation that he's done in each one of us, and um, and thank him for that. So God, we do come before you now, Lord, and we see, Lord, in the turning of the water to the wine, Lord, that you are a God of transformation, Lord. You touch us and you change us, Lord. Just as you change that water into wine, Lord, you have changed me from a from a sinful man, from a somebody that was centered upon um, possessions and and money and power grabs, Lord. And and um, you have changed me, Lord, and made me uh, a man with a heart after God. And Lord, I know that many are, that are praying along with me, Lord, can testify. They can look back at their lives and say, I am so much different now. And Lord, there might be some that are listening right now that said, I haven't had that transformation yet. And friend, if that is you, then right now, ask God to touch you and transform you. Just as he touched that water and made it into wine, um, ask him to touch you and change you and make you more like him. And friend, if you're in need of his grace, we see how that wine represents grace and the favor from God. Lord, uh, Lord, help my friends. Friends, just, just open your heart to God. Don't let bitterness or unforgiveness or um, sexual sin, or sensual things, or covetousness, or jealousy, or uh, love for this world, or anything stop you from just coming to God and confessing your sins and asking for his grace, because his grace is abundant. Um, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus just turned all that wine, all that water into wine. He can turn things around in your life. Just confess your sins to him. Ask him for forgiveness. He will forgive you and flood you with his grace and his favor. And I thank you, Lord, for that was such an example of as we're in relationship with you, you do good things and you do them really well. And Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters and me and my family that, Lord, your hand would be upon our lives, that we would stay in relationship with you and we would just walk in the fullness of your blessing and the fullness of your favor, Lord. Lord, let us forsake the things of the world and follow you full heartedly, knowing that relationship with you makes all the difference. Friend, just keep on talking to God, and I will too. God bless you. Till next time.